Okay, so we'll now go to the next module. This is for the camera, and this is on convolutional neural networks. So, so far we have done what? We have just talked about a convolution operation. We have just taken some input boxes and converted them to output boxes. What does this anything of this have to do with neural networks? I keep saying that this is a course on neural networks, right? So, everything has to link to that. So, what is the connection? So, we will try to understand this by taking the example of image classification, and I will use the same trick to get everyone's attention. So, the next few slides are going to tell you the difference between machine learning and deep learning. Okay? So, now everyone will pay attention. So, this is the task you have given an image and you want to classify it into one of k categories and I am considering four categories here car, bus, monument, flower. Okay? What is the simplest thing that you can do? Suppose this is a 20 cross 20 image. Now, the simplest thing is given on the slide. You will just take this as a 400 dimensional input feature vector right? and you will treat it as a 4 class classification problem, train some multi class SVM or anything on that. right? So, you have a simple input. So, you are given some 1 million images, all of these are 400 dimensional and they come from 1, 2, 3 or 4. These are the 4 classes which is car, bus, monument and so on. So, you can just treat this as an input feature vector and uh, do your classification. right? That is the simplest thing that you, you would do. Or else what you could do is, you could do some kind of feature engineering. right? You could say that actually this entire blue sky is not really helping me in deciding anything. These entire green lawns and all this is not helping. If monument, car, bus and flower are the classes, what I care about is the shapes. I do not care about the details inside the shapes. I am not trying to decide whether the car is of a blue color or what model the car is and so on. right? All I want to see is that, that this particular shape of a car is present or not. Now, what kind of filter gives you the shape of the image? Edge detector, right? So, I could use edge detector. So, now this is something that I have used based on my domain knowledge that for these four classes, actually just detecting the shape is important. So, I will ignore everything else. So, there is a lot of details there, right? So, I have actually sparsified my entire input. I have just looked in looking at the edges in the input and now this is a better refined feature as compared to the earlier feature. How many of you agree that this is a more refined feature representation? Right. But this was handcrafted. I actually hand coded the edge detector kernel because I knew that it is 8 at the center and minus 1 everywhere else. Right? That is how I thought of it that that is what an edge detector is or at least I read about it somewhere. Right. So, that is how you would do it. So, this is feature engineering. So, what is this? This is how you do machine learning, right? You take an input, you do some feature engineering, and then you train a classifier on top of that. But now you could become even more creative with the feature engineering, and that's what the uh, computer vision community was doing largely before 2012. Come up with different ways of capturing better and better features from images. So two popular Im uh, features from that era, and that's I'm just talking about 2012, not some like 500 years back, but from that era were SIFT and HOP features which actually tell you how do the gradients of these pixels change across the image. That is again try to capture something like how, what is the variation in the image from pixel to pixel. Right? So, that is the essence. Right? How is the, you do not care about these entire blue patterns because they are just telling you sky, it is redundant. Right? If you have seen some 10 pixels or 20 pixels which are sky, you know that a large part of it is going to be sky. So, these try to capture some abstractions from the image and these are better than the edge detectors and these features were extremely popular. So, what you would do is you take your original input. This is a deterministic algorithm. You apply the hog algorithm or the SIFT algorithm and it gives you a transformed representation for the image and you can use this transform representation to do classification. And a lot of work prior to 2012, 2011 showed that these features work extremely well, ac well across a wide variety of uh, across a wide variety of image tasks. Okay? So, again what was happening here? This was feature engineering right? because someone realized that what I care about is this gradation in the input images and I can capture this by this nice algorithm called SIFT or HOC. Of course, someone came up with that algorithm, but it is still kind of feature engineering. Right? Uh, so, this is how the learning is to happen is you are given some input, you do a static feature extraction, no learning. So, feature extraction is deterministic. You take the input, pass it through one of these algorithms, either the edge detector or the blur detector or SIFT or HOG and you get some representation for the input. And the only learning that happens is, 
on top of this transformed input. So you now have a transformed input and on top of that you are going to train a classifier and you are going to learn the weights of the classifier. So the only thing that you learn is the weights of the classifier. So that is equivalent to learning only the softmax layer in case of a feed forward neural network. That is the output layer, right. Now instead of using these, so this is the question, instead of using these handcrafted kernels or features such as edge detectors or uh, blur detectors or what not, can we learn meaningful kernels in addition to learning the weights of the classifier? Do you get this question at least whether the answer or not, but you get the question. So what I am asking is that why should I hand code this edge detector, okay. Why not have, after all what is the edge detector? It is like a 3 cross 3 matrix, right. And I have seen tons of such matrices in my feed forward neural networks. I have dealt with very large matrices which were called parameters of the network. So why not have a 3 cross 3 or a 5 cross 5 or whatever dimensional matrix and try to learn what should be the right values in this matrix instead of hand coding the edge detector matrix. Do you get the idea? How to do that is still far, but at least do you get the idea? That is what I am, we are trying to do, okay. So now instead of just learning the weights of the classifier, we also want to learn the weights of the kernels. That means instead of using handcrafted features, I am now going to learn the features. So that is the difference between diff deep learning and machine learning. Right? So you had handcrafted features there and now you are going to learn the representations also by treating them as additional parameters in your network. How you will do that we will see and it is very simple given that you understand how to train feed forward neural networks. But then why just stop there? Why just have one feature representation for the input? Can I learn multiple such kernels? Right? I could have one 3 cross 3 matrix which learned this first representation, another 3 cross matrix which learned this another representation and yet another 3 cross 3 or 5 cross 5 or 7 cross 7 matrix which learns this different representation. So instead of learning one static representation from the input, I could learn multiple representations from the input. In fact, why not, why just stop there? What is the next thing that I am going to try to do? Multiple layers of features, right? So that means at the first layer, I learned this representation. Now I could take this and try to learn an even more abstract representation from there and then keep doing this to make it deeper and deeper. Do you get this? Okay. So at every stage, now I have these parameters which are helping me learn the representation of the input. I am learning multiple representations at every layer and then having multiple layers of these representations, right? And everything is learnable end to end, okay? So you get the difference between deep learning, machine learning now. There is no handcrafting of features, you are learning the feature representation. I know, I understand there is some confusion about how you would do this, but we will get to that. Just trust me on that, that you will be able to figure out how to do this, okay? And all of this, we have some weight matrices here, we have some weight matrices here. These are the layer 1 weight matrices, they are the layer 2 weight matrices and these are the output layer matrices. And we see this layer wise arrangement of these weight matrices and we are very comfortable with this because we have done feed forward neural networks where we had these multiple layers and we knew how to back propagate from the last layer to the first layer. Now what I am trying to say is that I would like to adjust these weights of filters in such a way that my classification loss is minimized. And what is the loss function that I am going to use here? Cross entropy because this is a multi-class classification problem, okay. So just hang on with this intuition and we will make it more clear, fine. So such a network which has these multiple convolution, learned convolution operations at every layer and then multiple such layers is known as a convolutional neural network, okay, fine. So I get this idea that we need to learn kernel filters by just treating them as parameters of the classification model, okay. But how is this different from a regular feed forward neural network? You could have taken a regular feed forward neural network and I will show it to you on the next slide. And what is the difference between that and a convolution operation? So if you understand that, then you would be done for this lecture. So, yeah. So we have an input. So let us say now I will take back the MNIST uh, case where you are given an input as an image and these are digit inputs and you want to classify them into one of 10 inputs. And I am going to assume that my input is 4 cross 4, that means I have 16 pixels, okay. So the simplest thing that I could have done or the feed forward neural network way of doing this is that I would just flatten out this image, I will get 16 inputs. I need 10 outputs at the output layer, so I would have an output layer which will have one of these 10 classes 
and then I add as many layers that I want in between. Okay, this is what a feed forward neural network would look like. And if I consider any one neuron in the first layer, it takes inputs from all the 16 inputs, right? That's how a feed forward neural network is. You have these extremely dense connections where every output depends on every input at every layer, okay? Now, yeah, so this is the same story which I have said. Now let's look like, look at what a convolutional neural network looks like. So again, you have these 16 uh, inputs. I'm using a two cross two convolution, okay? Now, if I use a two cross two convolution, uh, if I place it here, then I'm using pixels one, two, five, and six, and computing one value. So you see the difference between this and a feed forward neural network? In a feed forward neural network, H11 would have depended on 16 values, 16 inputs. In a convolutional neural network, it is depending on four. only four, only four neighbors, okay? And similarly, H12, I'm using a stride of two, by the way, right? So I'm not placing the filter here, I'm just skipping one step. H12 would depend on pixels three, four, seven, eight, okay? And so on, right? So one thing is clear that as opposed to a feed forward neural network, you have sparser connections here. Is that clear? And why do we have sparse connections? Because we are exploiting our knowledge about images that in an image, you don't really care about the interactions between on between a pixel at the leftmost, left topmost corner and the right bottom corner, right? So there is sky here, there is ocean here, or there are trees here. You would want to capture the neighborhood around that pixel, not really capture it with the entire image. That's why you don't want all of these 16 inputs to contribute. You only want a small neighborhood to contribute. Do you get that intuition? Okay. So this is the first property of a convolutional neural network that it has sparse connectivity. Okay. But is sparse connectivity really good? I just made a case for that and I'm going to counter argue, right? Is it really good that you have these sparse connections? Because you're losing out information, right? You're losing out uh, interactions between certain pixels. So how, why can, why is that good? I'm hearing a lot of interesting answers, but remember that you're always going to have multiple layers, okay? So this, consider these two pixels. In the first layer, these two pixels did not interact because H2 only depended on these three and H4 only depended on these three. There is no, a, there is no unit here which depends on both X1 and X5. Is that obvious? Because I'm just using a window of size three. But now once I go to the next layer, once I go to G3, G3 depends on H2, H3, H4 here, which in turn depends on X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, right? So even though at this layer, X1 and X5 are not interacting with each other, as you go deeper, these interactions become obvious. Do you get that? Right, so that's why you'll always use a deep convolutional neural network where all the pixels get to interact at a deeper layer. But at the more immediate layers, you just want to capture the interactions between a neighborhood. So it's like you take this neighborhood, find out something, then take neighborhoods of neighborhoods and then try to find out something at the next layer and keep continuing in this way. How many of you get this? Right? Okay, so this is what sparse connectivity looks like. Another characteristic of CNNs is something known as weight sharing. So let us see what it is. So remember I had considered this two cross two kernel and I was placing it at these four pixels, which is pixels one, two, five and six. And I was placing another kernel at these four pixels, which is pixels 11, 12, 15 and 16, right? These four pixels. And I've used different colors for them, indicating that these filters are different. So they are both two cross two filters, but I'm assuming that the values inside them are different. Does this have to be the case? Just think what a filter is trying to do. It's striding across the entire image. At every location, I want to do the same operation. Remember when we are doing blurring or edge detection or sharpening, I had the same filter which I was applying at every location. So I want to see what is the effect of this filter throughout the image. So I don't really want to change this filter. That means these four weights would be the same as the pink weights. How many of you get this? So this is the question. Do we want the kernel weights to be different for different portions of the image? 
So imagine that we are trying to learn a kernel that detects edges. So the same kernel configuration is required throughout the image because that's the kernel configuration which will detect an edge. So you want the same kernel to be there everywhere. So we are going to share these weights. We shouldn't, they shouldn't be these pink and orange weights. We'll just have the same weights everywhere. Okay. So this is known as weight sharing. So now this is something ridiculous if you think about it. Now how many weights do I have in layer 1? 4 weights, that's all. That looks too less, right? It would lead to dash fitting, underfitting because you have very few parameters. So how do I deal with this situation? You'll have multiple kernels, right? So you'll have another kernel which detects something else. You'll have one more kernel which detects something else and you can have as many such kernels, right? So the more the number of kernels you'll have, you'll have that many into 4 as the number of parameters and that many outputs at layer 1. How many if you get this? Okay, good. So these are the two important characteristics of convolutional neural networks. One is sparse connections and the other is weight sharing, okay? So, so far we have focused only on the convolution operation. Now let us see what does a full convolutional neural network look like. Or maybe I'll do this next time, I think this. Is